Our last speaker for the morning session also probably doesn't need a lot of introduction. Most of you probably know Captain Jeff Friedman. Uh, who is the owner of Maya's Legacy. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, it's it's really awesome to be here. Um, I uh, it's it's still overwhelming to me um, what I get to do every day and to share that with people. I saw my first wild killer whales in 2010, um, so not really that long ago. And at that time, I was I had a very different career. I was uh, living where I lived most of my life, which I refer to as the whale capital of the world. Uh, Cleveland, Ohio, um, and somehow I ended up on, I, once I saw, had that first experience with wild killer whales, I knew in that moment that my life was never going to be the same. Um, and I ended up on this crazy windy path down the rabbit hole and ended up in the right place at the right time uh, to be able to move out here and share whales with people. And there are a lot of people in this room who were a, a big help and, and support to me. Um, and there, there are some people who unfortunately are not in this room anymore um, who also um, were, were supportive and, and helped me get to where I am. Um, I want to share a little bit of information about, um, so there's been a lot of changes just in, in the nine seasons that I've been here, and both in terms of whale watching and the whales. And I want to share some of that with you uh, quickly before lunch um, and leave with some really positive success stories um, because in all the work that that everybody is doing and all the, the the challenging work I think it's really important to celebrate the, the positive and the success stories to create more success stories um, so as far as whale watching out here uh, the Pacific Whale Watching Association uh, is 30 companies out of 23 different uh, harbors in Washington State and British Columbia it is, I'm really proud to work in this community. It is, I've been whale watching many places around the world. Uh, this is by far from what I've seen the most collaborative uh, and conservation or, and education oriented community. Um, and also um, working closely with uh, research and, and conservation organizations. Um, one of the really cool things that has developed over the last several years is starting to use an app to track sightings of all different types of wildlife and different populations of whales. And that, is, that app is used not just by the whale watching companies in this area, but also north up in Campbell River, um, up in Johnstone Strait. So we're actually able to, and this is all getting databased, and so we're able to now follow individuals in different populations, um, where they're traveling, uh, how long they're staying in different areas. And to me personally, over time, this is going to be an incredible amount of data that no single entity could ever be on the water collecting. It's, it's a really big collaboration. And there are other partners out there that are also using this, like the, the Washington State Ferries, DC Ferries, uh, Coast Guard, uh, some, some of the commercial marine shipping, and they're using that information so that they know where whales are, so that they can adjust some of their operations. Um, so commercial shipping is often, they're adjusting their course, so they know that there are whales in their paths, uh, ferries as well. Uh, so it's, it's been really, really cool. I'm really interested to see some of the long-term uh, trends in, in, the, in the data. Uh, one of the other things that we've started tracking in, in the app, um, it's something we've always done, but we've never really had a firm handle on it how often, and we're doing it, and I think tracking it is also reinforcing doing it, um, are doing proactive sentinel actions when we're out there. Um, if, if you've ever been on the water here, you know these are shared waterways that can be very crowded with all different types of boaters. And whales are hard enough to find when you're looking for them. Uh, when you are going from point A to B and you're not, you have no idea where whales are, you're not looking for them, you're never going to know. Uh, so one of the things that we will do is we will proactively warn vessels of, that there are whales in the area to slow them down and to hurt them. Um, these are, this can be done 
uh, over the radio. It can be done in uh, several different ways. And one of those other ways is uh, waving a whale warning flag. That started uh, about three or four years ago, and it's it was around the region it is becoming more commonly uh, common in, in the awareness of boaters to, of what that means uh, to slow vessels down around whales. Most of the boats, ferries, commercial shipping, recreational boaters, most of them are very grateful when we alert them. Um, I would say you know almost all of them, and this is a, a daily or multi-daily um, occurrence when this when this happens. Um, there's also marine debris on the floor. Um, this is many times a day. I, there are multiple um, postings in, in the app every day of balloons uh, being pulled out of the water. Um, I, in my personal opinion, I think this is some of the most important work that we're doing. Um, these are lines that I, I pulled out of the water uh, about 10 days ago. Um, these were so heavy and so long, there was enough line in there that this may be my biggest contribution that I will ever make out here because I think this, just this bunch of line is enough that what could have been fatal to uh, uh, an adult humpback, killer whale, uh, you name it. Uh, so it's really important. That's some of the most important stuff that we're doing. Um, last year, I uh, showed how many how many different types of actions that we have, were taking. We um, are definitely on pace to um, surpass this this year. Um, and then as far as removing vessels, all different types of vessels. It's, it's predominantly recreational, but there are lots of, of, of vessels that, that we're out there giving a heads up as well. Um, as, and we're also obviously we're tracking the species that we're seeing. And you can see humpbacks and big killer whales are at the top of that list. Um, one of the biggest changes that I've seen in, in the last nine years is started prior to, to me coming out here, but it really uh, has been uh, very, very much increased in, in my time here. Um, you can see the southern rest of killer whales are al almost next to um, second from, from last there. And there's been a huge shift in uh, fewer sightings of southern resident killer whales in the inland waters, and a huge increase of sightings of uh, big killer whales in these waters. We see there's at least one family of big killer whales in the Salish Sea almost every single day of the year. Uh, many days there are multiple families, uh, sometimes together, sometimes uh, traveling separately. Um, the interesting thing with the southern residents and what we've noticed is and this really started accelerating after uh, the passing of J2, our Grammy, is you, like the boat that they used to use of their predictable patterns has been completely thrown out, and their, their patterns have been really inverted. Um, the, the, they are more frequently here in the inland waters now for between like mid-September uh, through the fall and winter, um, and they're here less in the spring and summer. Um, and not surprisingly, that's very much correlated with the presence of um, Greater River Chinook Salmon. Uh, there's a new paper that was just uh, published, a peer-reviewed paper from Michael Wheeling Shields from Orca Behavior Institute that talks about this. And I think there probably will be more information uh, probably at Superpod. But I promised you, and I, I wanted to focus on some, some really cool, happy, success stories. And one of those is with the pigs killer whales that people sometimes still, but, but not, not as often referred to as, as transient, but we really are get to starting to call them bigs. And their population is just overwhelmingly booming. Um, not just in the terms of our sightings with them, but they're in, I think, their 10th year of this massive baby boom uh, lots, their survival rate of their offspring is, is possibly better than humans. Um, and it, at least from, from my perspective, you know, I don't know that this population has been witnessed to this degree ever before in this detail. And their culture is so different from Southern residents. It is unique. Um, it is fascinating what we're learning. Um, they really have the very complex 
uh, social dynamics. And it's been really fun to see this population. Um, lots, I mentioned lots of babies. Um, so when we have these multifamily uh, group meetups, you'll have little play groups with, with babies. Um, we have uh, teenage males from different families, but the families are friends. And a couple of, we had, last year we had two 15 year old boys from two different families go off on their own and decided that they were gonna spend about a month or so together, just the two of them. And what do 15 boys, 15 year old boys do? They eat a lot. Um, so we, we actually uh, named these two the Butcher Boys. And uh, they, I mean, it was, it, and they were together and inseparable for, I think it was over a month until one of the moms and, and the rest of her kids came in and collected them and took the other one back to his mom. Um, we have a uh, we have a independent males in this population who bounce around to different families or sometimes on their own or sometimes with other independent males. We have uh, very fascinating. We have a nine year old independent male um, who we we saw him. He first dispersed from his mom and siblings when he was just five. Um, it was kind of kind of a surprise. Um, he is now like the social butterfly. He is uh, with different groups. Um, different family groups. Uh, if you were out yesterday, he was he was there with his aunt and cousins, um, who met up with another family, and then he left with the other family. Um, he travels on his own sometimes. This this winter, he spent a lot of time with an independent male who's in his early 60s. So kind of cool. The the nine year old boy is out there with the OG, um, but really really cool stories that we're we're getting to see and learn about. Um, and the amount of offspring that they're having is um, staggering, especially when you look at it next to the southern residents and, and the survival. And this is, I will note, this is, this, these numbers, this was put together before the, the latest two uh, births in LPOD. But this shows what's possible in a population that has enough food. Um, and that's like, that's what we should take from this slide is how quickly they can rebound um, if there's enough food for them to eat. Um, the other success story, um, and I love telling this and, and, and sharing this on, on the boat with people, are humpbacks in these waters. Um, when I first got here in 2015, we would occasionally see humpbacks, but it wasn't very often. Um, we had an ID catalog from the Salish Sea that had 100 humpbacks um, in that catalog. Um, this is an old feeding area for, for humpback whales. And they were all hunted out during commercial whaling from this area. And it was, they were hunted out by the early 1900s. And after that, there, there were no humpbacks that remembered this feeding area. And so it wasn't until the early 2000s until um, we started to see humpbacks coming here. Um, this is a humpback, um, probably the most famous humpback in this region. Uh, her name is Big Mama. Um, she is credited with being the first humpback. Like she, in my mind, I like to think like there was this legend of this lost feeding area and she unlocked it and found it. Um, she returned here, um, actually in the late 90s, she was photographed here. She was photographed here in the early 2000s um, and she had a calf with her. Um, she still is back here every summer. Um, she has brought seven calves with her. Um, she, her like, latest calf was last year. Um, and one of the really cool things I was talking about tracking, being able to track data, um, we have Big Mama's family tree of all of the whales, all of her calves, her grandkids, and her great grandkids. There was a, a question about her first calf, if it was actually um, hers, but that has been confirmed through old photos that it was. So we do know that these are all of her, her this is her family tree. Um, and what one thing that's not represented on her here is her 2016 calf uh, came back this year with a calf. Um, so this also, this, this shows what's possible, what animals will do if we get out of the way and stop killing them. Um, it's, it's, those are the messages to take out of this uh, that I want to want to let everybody go to lunch with. That there are success stories out there to be celebrated and to recharge everybody in, in going through to taking on new challenges. Um, this is this. There's a lot that's possible to create out there. So thank you guys.
Any, any questions? Yeah. Go ahead. So the, the question was about the pigs eating Chinook. They do not eat Chinook. They are strictly marine mammals. Seals, sea lions, porpoise. Uh, sometimes um, we, we have seen some minke whale hunts, um, but no fish. Um, yeah, so it's all, it's all marine mammals. So I, one of the concerning things politically that's come up is there, there are some calls for pinniped calls. Uh, to help with salmon recovery. And I mean, from what we're seeing on the water, we have the most efficient pinniped culling system in place already. Um, and and one of the, the phrases that we use in hashtags is bigs are the balance. Um, this was all in balance before we were here and we just need to stay out of the, the when we get out of the way, things will balance themselves. Oh, it's a uh, sperm whale. Oh, it's a sperm whale. Yeah, we had one one day for one afternoon a sperm whale come through here. Do you still drive a hydrophone in the water when you're listening to big whales compared to residents? And have you noticed any differences as far as they don't use dialect compared to big residents? So, so the pigs are definitely not nearly as vocal okay. um, as the southern residents. Uh, yeah, we think that's because the bigs their prey can hear. Um, but when, they, when they're really social and they're in multiple family groups or after they've, um, the, when they're prey sharing, uh, we will get vocals and they are as different from the Southern residents in terms of what you hear as listening to like Spanish and Chinese. Yeah, 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 yeah. Their vocals are, are pretty, pretty cool. Uh, go, go ahead back there in the back. I heard this is a bit more common in residents than in pigs, but I, like, since you've been out of the water of these years, have you had anything like that that I commonly seen with uh, the pigs? It's, I mean, as far as them vocalizing, uh, like, by the boats? Like, like, Literally vocalizing to us, like, yeah, I've, I've, I've seen it. It's not common, but I've, I've seen that happen um, where they where they do like I, I've had them like lift their head out of the water and, and, and you hear the vocals above the water and, and it is almost like they're they're vocalizing to you. Um, but I can't tell you what they were saying. <laughs> <laughs> It's, um, yeah, uh, I'm glad you asked that. Yeah, so Big Mama is a uh, Hawaiian, um, but we do get, um, I, I think it's about 50-50 between Hawaii and Mexico here. So like word is out that that the, the lost feeding area has been found. Um, and we do get quite a, quite a few from, from Mexico as well. And it's interesting because up here, they're, I mean, they're not breeding, but they are mixed together. So it's it's almost like they have their, like their summer whales and their winter whales. Uh, go ahead, in the back. Yeah, happywhale.com is, is incredible. You can upload, uh, if you get a fluke shot, upload it. You can put in the location and You'll get a, a match. It'll, it'll email you and tell you who that humpback is. You can see all the documented sightings, and you can sign up to get emailed every time that that whale is, is seen. Go ahead in the corner. Let's, you know, looks can be deceiving, you know, with 
It's, it's such a good question um, because I mean, what, what she's referring to is when you see whale watching boats, but you're watching from shore, you're higher up, you're further away, and even when you're on the water, um, like there, there are some great examples of um, lens compression, things looking so much closer. Um, if you've ever been in our office, there's a big picture on, on the wall of a killer whale in Friday Harbor right by the ferry. And I took that picture and that killer whale was actually not in the harbor, but it sure looks like it is. Um, and it's just educating people um, on, on that and you know, really one by one. I mean, there are a lot of people that are shore-based whale watchers that also understand that and that understand that we are out there following regulations and that this is one of the, the most regulated whale watching industries on areas on, uh, in the world. We have, if you were out yesterday, one of the families that we were with, uh, the T65Bs, she took her kids down to Monterey Bay for about a month uh, this spring. Um, and she was hanging out with, with what's that? Yeah, she did, did some damage down there too. Um, and yeah, she was down there for about a month. Well, down there, so they're watching the same whales that we're watching here, like literally the same whales. There are no regulations. There are guidelines from Marine Mammal Protection Act, but there are no actual distance regulations at all um, in California. So it's just, it's, it, it's interesting, um, but it's, it's just providing the information is really the only thing we can do. Yeah. I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I think largely it's, it's because of the Southern residents and their endangered status um, that, that has led to, to regulations. Um, but there, there you go. I mean, you see K's and L's down in Monterey now too. So I don't know. Is, is that Monterey Bay for many years, uh, Monterey Bay has had a huge recovery. So there was not a lot of whale watch. There were some, but not, I mean, now it's constant, sort of as you're describing. Um, so for many years, Monterey Bay, you never see whales, and including in the San Francisco Bay area and down further south. It's, they seem, the, the entire ecosystem in Monterey Bay has definitely improved. So. It is a great, great place. I mean, there's so much life down there now. It's pretty amazing. Well, it's, it, I mean, it, so it's, it's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's been, yeah, it, it has definitely been, um, you know, politically, I was on the um, Orca Recovery Task Force with, with um, that Jay Inslee put together. And I mean, it was politically, that was the biggest thing that came out of the task force was, were more vessel regulations. And it, it's easier than breaching dams politically uh, to create, um, you know, whale watching regulations. But there, I mean, the Southern residents now have some of the most restrictive, um, we've been watching them for when we, when we do see them here for the last several years, we've been watching them from a half a mile. Um, and that in 2025 goes into place for recreational vessels as well. Um, but we don't, I mean, we very rarely, I mean, I can count on one hand how many how many trips I've seen Southern residents on um, this this season. But the best, really the best time to see them is like mid, you know, any, like September uh, on the west side here is your best bet for seeing Southern residents. Oh, go ahead. Thank you so much for your work uh, involving gathering debris, marine debris, and I'm just wondering if that marine debris is then going to 
some uh, agency or organization that is tracking, you know, okay, so there's this many pounds of fishing net, this many pounds of it's yeah we're not we're not tracking that yet but it, it's something that i was thinking about when i was putting this pre presentation together of like it's cool that we're now tracking that we're how much we're doing it but it'd be really cool to track how much of of what type of debris we're pulling out and and where yeah i mean it's it's pretty widespread um because of the the tides and the currents here i mean we we're I know, would love to, would love to, to be able to track where it came from. Lots of birthdays and graduations. And, <laughs> yeah. I understand that that would be a lot of extra work for you guys. It would, but, it, but it's worth, it's worth tracking that kind of stuff. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Any, any other? Oh, go ahead. Um, like in the world or around here? Around here. It's, you know, it's, it's tough. I mean, with the Southern residents, the west side, um, when they are here, the west side of San Juan Island is a great spot. Um, the bigs don't follow any kind of pattern. Um, there are days where we have them right out in front of the harbor, and then there are days where we go 40 miles. Uh, they really move, they move 50 to 100 miles a day. There's no prediction. Um, we, I mean, it wasn't just the 65 bees. We had a family a couple of years ago that they were down here, and less than two weeks later, they were being seen up in Juneau. Um, so there's there's just a lot of movement. Um, so yeah, there's but. West side for, for Southern residents. And you will see humpbacks and, and possibly bigs out there too. Um, it's, it's getting out on the water or, or going to the west side and looking. Uh, you won't find any in, in here that I, that I can tell you. <laughs> Are you worried at all um, about uh, the whales learning behavior from the other side of the world? In terms, okay, this is, this is, okay, this is, I'm glad somebody asked that, because we've been getting questions about, like, people are worried to come out on the boats because they're, like, asking how many, how many orcas have attacked our boats this year. Um, so, um, I, I um, was re uh, recruited by uh, Monica Leland Shields at Orca Behavior Institute. Um, she was contacted by a crew from ABC Nightline. Um, and we we took them out to see um, some some big killer whales, and they were doing a story about this. And there's been so much in the media about this, and the Nightline story aired last Monday, so I'm, it's available online. And they did a really good job of covering what's going on there in context. And so what's what's happening there is, I mean, it's a small percentage of vessels, and it is a very specific design of a rudder. So they're not just going after any vessel or any rudder, and they're playing with these rudders. And sometimes, if you're in big seas and you lose your rudder, like your your ship is going to have some issues, right? Like, you, and you may start taking on water. But they're not attacking people. And if they wanted to sink boats, they'd have a really good hit rate. I mean, they'd be sinking almost every boat they went after. Um, and I don't, I don't know that. So I think whatever is going on over there, and this was covered well by Nightline, it, there's, this is a fad, and they're, they're enjoying this. They're, they've got a game spreading through the population um, over there. And if I, I can tell you if that somehow spread over here, I will line the bottom of my boat with those rudders. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more. I'm also working on watching in Canada in the summer and in Mexico in the winter, and I get a lot of it like, oh, you're harassing the way, or you're an obvious Like, bringing all this information that people together is, is very, very important to see this part of how 
people who are lucky enough to be out there on the water pretty much every day can find all these things and all the amazing jobs that you've done. So thank you so much for sharing that. Thank, thank you. I really appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.